What can Canadian firearms owners expect if nothing is done to preserve their rights as they currently are? What can we expect to see in the future? You can expect full-on gun bans. Um, this is what the Liberal Party of Canada, they have a majority government right now, and this is what they've been after, to ban guns. If you are one of the 2.2 million law-abiding firearms owners here in Canada, it's absolutely imperative that you go and support the Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights by becoming a member. If even a fraction of Canadian gun owners supported this organization, just imagine the potential then for common sense firearms legislation in this country. After you watch this video, put your pennies together, go and become a member to the CCFR. I receive absolutely no financial gain for putting my YouTube channel in the crosshairs like this. So what I would ask you to do is to go and become a member and let the CCFR know who sent you. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today we have Rod Giltaka. He's the CEO and Executive Director of the Canadian Coalition for Firearms Rights. He's gonna answer some questions about that organization today. And uh, yeah, just give you guys a bit of insight as to what they do and how you can support a great cause. So maybe you could tell us a bit about what is the CCFR, what do you do? So the CCFR is, we're an advocacy organization trying to protect and expand the rights of gun owners in Canada. Uh, primarily we're a public relations organization and one, uh, one of those never existed for gun owners before. So the type of stuff that we do that's probably different from any other advocacy organization is that uh, we work with media. Um, we create promotional material. We have a television show, first time ever in Canadian broadcast history that uh, Canadians had their own show, Canadians that would um, shoot black rifles and handguns. We've never seen that before. So that helps normalize our hobby and our sport. It helps uh, provide the recognition um, that Canadian gun owners um, deserve and the respect that we deserve. So we do stuff like that. We make informational videos like uh, explainer videos, fully animated explainer videos. No one's ever done that before either. We have, uh, we have and about- that's on your YouTube channel? Yeah, the CCFR, the CCFR channel on YouTube. Uh, easy to find, it'll pop right up. Yeah. A, it's a, that channel's grown really fast. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the kind of stuff that we do is stuff that just gets us you know, out, from, out from the shadows because yeah. gun owners have been afraid for a long time. And we shouldn't be. We should say we're the safest demographic in Canada. We get a daily criminal record check. There's no reason why we should be hiding our hobby or apologizing for it. Absolutely. And where can people watch that TV show if they want to check it out? So season one, uh, it's called the name of the show is called the CCFR's Canada Downrange. And season one uh, started airing last January. It airs throughout the entire year, all the way to this December on uh, Wild Pursuit. So that's a specialty channel. And then this uh, season two will actually be on the Sportsman channel. So season two will start this coming January. Okay, perfect. So can they access that online? Is it available online? It's not available online, although Wild Pursuit TV has an online app or website that you can subscribe to. Okay. So it's not on YouTube or anything like that. Some expert excerpts have been out there, yeah. um, but uh, that's just the way it works with TV. What you're saying is uh, one of the goals is to normalize shooting in Canada. Well, yeah, a lot of people engage in it. There's 2.2 million licensed gun owners in the country. Um, as I said, we get a daily criminal record check. It's called continuous eligibility screening. Sometimes people are saying, no, you don't. Like, yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> I assure you. <laughs> I assure you I know what the regulations are. Um, and we think that, that's, that that speaks volumes of how reliable and, uh, and law-abiding gun owners are. And we just, again, we're the only minority uh, in Canada where it's not only acceptable to discriminate against us for the fact that we're gun owners, uh, but it's encouraged. Right. It's actually encouraged. So that's, that's not right for any, anyone else, and it's not right for, to do that to us either. Absolutely. Yeah. In your opinion, what's the biggest misconception of firearms enthusiasts and sport shooters? Well, I think um, probably if I was to think from the perspective of the, of the general public, uh, it would be that um, they think that gun owners are all ticking time bombs and that it's only a matter of time till we go crazy and start shooting people. When in fact, um, history doesn't show us that, that, you know, have there been gun owners that have gone crazy and shot people? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But there's 2.2 million of us that are licensed and probably another 2, two million that are unlicensed, mm -hmm. although in what we would call unauthorized but peaceful possession of a firearm. 
And how many instances like that can you name? Like, I don't know, 11, right. you know, 15 ever. So it's, um, you know, again, if we looked at gun ownership with the same lens, the same lens of reasonableness that we look at uh, anything else, you know, like ownership of cars, ownership of, ownership of chainsaws, of skydiving, alcohol, you know, uh, there's a lot of things in, in, uh, in life that we don't particularly need that represent a, a risk to public safety. And our line is that licensed gun owners do not represent a disproportionate risk to public safety. And unless the government and the anti-gun types can prove that we do, you don't you don't get to take our things away right so you need a reason to take our things away and like you said the requirements are so stringent for storage transport i mean it, it takes a lot of uh, you have to have a lot of things set up before you even go and buy a gun like you know you have to get a license and you have to make sure you have a place to store it and all of those things so yeah in order to do that you, you can't just be you know uh, somebody with bad intent probably isn't even going to have the discipline to follow through with the steps to to go and legally do that so it's, well, it's not it's a lot easier to get an illegal gun than it is to get a legal right. gun right so what do you think is the biggest barrier towards more common sense uh, firearms legislation in canada uh it's it's lies it's lies because the you know it's interesting the anti-gun side of, of of the debate that we've been having in canada since forever um they they use a lot of uh, hyperbole and they use a lot of lies and they hyper focus on bad things that happen. There's bad things that happen in all kinds of things. Um, a quarter million people a year die in Canada from a wide variety of causes. On average, 160 die from firearm related homicide. Yeah. You know, um, and I think the, the problem is with, uh, with the anti-gun folks, they use, as I mentioned, a lot of hyperbole. They out and out lie. They say things like a child. You know, this is a, a, the doctor's group, right? Doctors, spin doctors for protection from guns. Uh, is what I like to call them. Uh, they tweeted, well, their consultant tweeted, that a child in Ontario, there's a ch one child a day injured by a, by a gun in Ontario. And that's not true at all. So we actually made an animated explainer video and posted that everywhere that they were posting that information. Yeah. And I just think that um, if there's some honesty and some maturity brought back into that conversation, that we will actually get to the bottom of what causes violence in our society and will actually help the people that need to be helped. It's the fact that these folks are motivated to actually out and out lie to influence uh, the debate, whereas we just want a, a factual conversation. So that's really one of the biggest things that we have to have to face and, and have to counter. It's not enjoyable. Why do you think people are so fearful of law abiding gun owners? Is it just a lack of information or is there something else to it? Well, I think it's something that they don't understand. And, you know, it's a uh, the, the majority of the people that I have to interact with uh, or debate with or whatever you want to call them or fight with, whatever it is, they, the more vehement of an anti-gun person you are, when, when challenged, they'll demonstrate how little they know. So the less you know, the more of a proponent of gun control you are. And it's, it's interesting. There's a, there's, when we first started the CCFR, which was only you know, four years ago, um, I said, you know, here's, here's the real question that we need the Canadian public to, to consider. Uh, if I went to downtown Vancouver or downtown Toronto and I stopped someone on the street and I said, do you think we should loosen, loosen restrictions on handguns? What do you think they would say? You know, they say, no, yeah. you know, there's enough shootings going on with handguns as it is. Yeah. And then I would say, well, what are the, exi what are the existing re restrictions on handguns? And they would be like, I don't know. And that's a problem. Because people think, oh, you just, you know, you go to a store and you check the handgun out and you can keep it loaded in your I mean, this is the picture that is being portrayed, portrayed or painted by the anti-gunners. And that's just not the case. You know, when it comes to restricted firearms, I can't even shoot a restricted firearm out here, but I can shoot a 50 cal bolt action. I can shoot a 50 cal semi-auto right now out here. Yeah. But I can't shoot a handgun or an AR-15 or any other specific gun that they don't like. But, right. you know, the, 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 reg the regulations... Are incredibly strict mm -hmm. and the the penalties for paperwork and administrative offenses are life-ending consequences right. um, but you know the general public doesn't know about that yeah. they don't know the real numbers about how responsible we are and the other side is willing to lie and, and misrepresent the truth and that's a it's a very stressful thing to deal with right mm -hmm. um, especially when in the case of recently when they're doctors you know how do you how do you how do you tell, a, tell people that a, a doctor is lying to you? It's very difficult, even though in this case they are. 
very high status people. So, yeah. yeah. I've seen a video you did a few years ago where you were interviewing people. I think it was in possibly in Vancouver, just yeah. people on the street. Mm -hmm. The man on and, the street, yeah. And I was very surprised at, you know, your approach. It was very, you know, professional. You weren't in their face. You weren't getting all aggressive or, you know, you weren't being overly overzealous about what you were trying to say. And a lot of the people seemed to, like who initially were against well, like you said, they would say, well, you know, we think we should have tighter restrictions against handguns. A lot of people kind of softened up to what you were saying because of the way you presented it. What suggestions might you have for somebody who's entering a debate about this kind of stuff with people to advocate for what you're advocating? So that's a, that's a, that's a very long discussion, but if I were to boil it down to a few comments, it's uh, number one, being aggressive with people doesn't work because their defenses go up. So you want to try to disarm them and like to me, when I approach some, when I approach somebody that will actually engage us, because very few people will, yeah. because for some reason I, I, like I can't find any of these doctors, I can't find any politicians, I can't find any senators, I can't find any anybody that will debate me in public, mm -hmm. and that's a really weird thing, right? Like I mean, you, you know, if they're right, yeah. that should be a walk in the park, yeah. but none of them will want to do it. So anyway, should I have an opportunity like that? First thing I'm going to do is determine. You want to disarm them. You want to get them comfortable because it's, it's a really, it's a rocky road because like I'll guarantee you, 98% of the time, you're going to be waking them up to the fact that they don't have a clue about this topic. Right. And that makes people defensive and then they get angry. Uh, people are generally not that strong, right? And so, in, at least in my experience, so they can't go, oh, you know what? I, I started talking, I didn't know anything. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, that was wrong. Uh, you have a few people that will be like that. So you wanna be considerate to them and just go, you know what, let's start this out. Well, how much do you know about firearm ownership? Like, do you know what the existing rules are, mm -hmm. what the existing laws are? And if they don't, that whole conversation now is shifting into something else. Now it's shifting into an, an educational direction. Yeah. You know, if you say, well, how many gun owners are there? You, you, you know, are you aware of that? Yeah. How widespread is firearm ownership? And then what happens is people start to think, and then you just want to guide them. You want them to come up with the answers themselves and when they're wrong, just go, actually, there's 2.2 million, or actually, you need, you need to be fully licensed. Yeah. And so it's almost like the so Socratic method, where you're, you're, you're presenting your position by asking questions, right? right? Like, do you think that it's legal right now to take a handgun to the, to the forest, mm -hmm. or even into the city? Well, you know, and then, the, and then they start paint, painting this picture. Yeah. You know, and especially with magazine size capacity, this might be interesting, because uh, this is one of the ones, this is a great opener. Do you think that magazine size, magazine capacity rules, right? Restricting the, the legal capacity of magazines. Does that have any relationship to public safety? And sometimes people will, it's funny because they do this with students, right? Yeah. And they're like, well, no, because they think that's what I want to hear. And then I say, well, what, you want a multiple victim public shooter to have a 90 round drum mag for an AR-15 so they can kill as many people as possible? Mm -hmm. And then they go, well, no, I don't want that. So yes, it's funny because people will change, right? Yeah. And then you say, okay, well, fair enough. Do you think that gangsters use five round pinned magazines, which are legal in Canada for semi-auto rifle? Mm -hmm. Do you think they use pinned magazines? Well, no. Well, do you think that a multiple victim public shooter would go all the way to where he's gonna do the shooting and he's pulled the pins out of his magazine, he's gonna shoot everybody? Do you think he's gonna stop in the parking lot and go, hold on, wait a second. I could face a serious firearm charge for these overcapacity magazines, right. right? Oh, you know what, I'm not gonna do it because I don't need that negativity in my life. Right, of course, that's, that's like talking to children, right? This is, this is, this is, this is infant level reasoning. Mm -hmm. and, and then I usually would follow up and say, do you know who does use five round mags? mags? That's me at the range. Mm -hmm. So if you can get a couple of examples and you gently and friendly and cordially talk to people and just say, well, does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. You know, and then, and then be reflective. Go, oh, you know what, we just kinda, you just kinda learned. Yeah. You know, you just busted a myth, right? That's a great approach that way. And I would add to that that, you know, you might not, I wouldn't expect to, for somebody on the spot to necessarily change their mind and agree with you. Mm -hmm. But I think so long as you've planted that seed, you know, that's a seed that might grow into something in the future and they may reflect a bit more, do a bit more research, or at least be a little less um, opposed to, to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, give them a chance to, to go away. And, and, but the thing is, if you, if you agitate them too much, 
It's funny because you really got to treat the people like that, like children. You get more bees with honey. As well, yeah, saying. and it's yeah. and it's it feels it feels demeaning or condescending to say that, but like literally, mm -hmm. the the whole gun control thing, as as far as um, you know, as I've discovered, is it's it's very cult like. And the minute you start making too much sense and it goes against their, their core beliefs because it's very emotional, yeah. it's a very polarizing topic, then people get really upset and you almost really got to treat them like kids. Yeah. And it's, uh, I, like I say, I don't want to talk about other people like that, but it's just, it's just the way it is. Well, and I think that's just a natural tendency. If you don't know a lot about something, yet you're, you're passionate about it at the same time, you're going to get upset if somebody proves you wrong. So if you can, if you can make it seem using that, Socratic uh, line of questioning and that they're actually coming to those conclusions themselves, then it, you know, it's not so much of a power struggle, mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. What can Canadian firearms owners expect if nothing is done to preserve their rights as they currently are? What can we expect to see in the future? You can expect full on gun bans. Um, this is what the Liberal Party of Canada, they have a majority government right now, and this is what they've been after to ban guns. And it's really difficult to predict because it's political. And the political sees change depending on, like I've seen bills pulled back that were ready to go through, ready to be presented. I've seen petitions pulled back. I've seen, you know, um, I've seen order paper questions pulled back. Like just really the mood of the people really, uh, really influences what happens even with, with gun laws. So, um, if the Liberal Party of Canada right now decides that it is in their benefit or they can derive benefit, it's in their interest um, in, a, in the election that's coming up to ban handguns or ban semi-autos, which we think is what they really want to do, they'll do it. You know, my understanding is that might even happen this summer. Now that Bill C-71 will be, it's not passed today, but it'll be passed very quickly. So you can expect all kinds of things. And, when, and, and bans, they can be ugly. They can be either there's just no, everybody that has their guns keeps them, but no new ones. It could be actual confiscations. It can be all kinds of stuff. The government has confiscated tens of thousands of firearms since the 90s. Mm -hmm. Like full on confiscations. A lot, not a lot of people know that. Right. So um, it's, uh, you, if, if you own guns or you want to own guns, you have to be politically active. And like in my mind, I, I don't want you to have to be politically active. We pay people to deal with public safety and they should be honest. Um, but unfortunately, we, we have to be involved and it's, it sucks, but that's reality. And so what is the CCFR doing to obviously hold back the, the floodgates of that? So there's traditionally um, firearm lobbies in Canada have been lobbies in that, you know, we're, we're telling uh, politicians that they'll never be elected again if they don't uh, bend to our will and threatening politicians and coercing them and all the rest of that stuff. Um, that has not worked for us in 20 years, 20, almost 30 years. That has not worked for us at all. Mm -hmm. You know, the biggest victory we had was we got rid of the long gun registry, which was pointless. Um, criminals don't register, register firearms. Uh, so <laughs> so we, got, we got rid of that. But other than that, like most, you know, 95% of all of those regulations uh, are still in place from the, from the early 90s. So for us, when we started the CCFR, we wanted to do something different. And we said, well, we understand the dynamic between the public mood and what the public will tolerate and the actions of politicians. That's where the real leverage is there. So I'll give you an example um, or, you know, a metaphor. Basically, if, if something is politically unpopular, then politicians won't do it. That's really, there's really a rule of thumb because politicians are incentivized by money and by power. I'm not painting them as monsters, right. but you know, even a lot of them can rationalize it by saying, if I'm not in power, I can't do any good. Yeah. So I am always worried about how am I gonna get elected? How, who do I have to tell what they want to hear to, for me to get reelected? Mm -hmm. And of course the pay is good for average people, right? Yeah. Starting wage for an MP is 100 and, well, it was 100 and, 172,000, I think. It was, used to be 168 yeah. for that four years that you're there. And even if you lose the next election, you get paid from full pay for six months mm -hmm. and your benefits continue. And that goes in, you don't get a retirement, but if you serve six years, you get a retirement. So for normal people, that's a pretty awesome job. Yeah. So they want to hang on to that. And they want the retirement, which again, they got to be elected twice. So if you look at the way that these people are incentivized, you figure out like, well, how am I going to incentivize them not to, not to beat up on gun owners? And how you do that is you make that unpopular. Yeah. So the PR organization idea that we started with is 
uh, we're going to the public. We're taking our message right to the Canadian people and dispelling myths and making animated explainer videos and informational videos and, and, uh, and press releases and, and press conferences right on Parliament Hill. We've done two of them last year. Mm -hmm. And those are, you get a lot of visibility out of that. Working with celebrities like Jim Shockey, yeah. you know, really getting the word out to people that it's like, I, I got to watch the politicians they are doing something wrong. Yeah. And the politicians see that and they're like, those CCFR guys are everywhere. That's what they say. They call us the Canadian NRA. Yeah, yeah. And not that the NRA, it's, we don't have the same ideology of the NRA, but we work just as hard, I guess, is what they're, we're everywhere. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, just making yourself ubiquitous and coming on social media and normalizing it in, in those ways is definitely very important. And so how can the average person support what you're doing? Because there isn't, there isn't a whole lot of people doing what you're doing, like getting out there, hitting the pavement, doing the, the hard work, the heavy lifting on the ground, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so, I mean, really, you're probably one of the main things Canadian, Canadians have right now to, like I say, uh, hold back the floodgates of this uh, potential gun ban. So what can people do to support you? They can become a member of the CCFR. It's 40 bucks a year. They get $5 million worth of insurance uh, as well. I mean, you're not buying the membership because you want insurance. You're buying it because you want to fuel the machine. So we have full time, we have four full time employees that are fighting on your behalf every single day, all day long. And advocacy is a lot of work and normal people don't have that much time and effort to be advocates because it's, it's a lot of work and it's detailed work and it's, you need people paid full time to do that all day long because that's what the big lobbies have. So Canada's never had a really big gun lobby. We've never had that. So when the anti-gunners say, oh, it's, it's the big Canadian gun lobby or it's this, you know, it's like, no, no, no. Yeah. It's a grassroots thing where individual gun owners are paying $40 a year to pool their resources to do all of these programs that we do, like the TV show and explainer videos and traveling around doing press conferences and, and paying for advertising and all that kind of stuff and getting our message out there and changing the public mood, thus changing the political gravitation for, you know, now, now maybe the Liberal Party goes, oh, I don't know if I want to do that because the CCFR will set us on fire. You know, so uh, you can become a member for 40 bucks a year. We, you, can, uh, you can donate to us on Patreon. Mm -hmm. So we have a little group called the uh, CCFR Insiders. Yeah. So you can, you can, if you donate $20 or more per month on Patreon, you get into the Insiders group on Facebook, which is a small group of people and they have access to us directly to ask questions and get a little bit inside information. Yeah. It's just something to try to add value. Um, or you can just donate money to us or you can, and or you can volunteer. You can become a few, uh, CCFR field officer meaning just that you're vetted and that you're, um, you understand our policies and then you're not really speaking on behalf of the CCFR, but you can man booths and, and th that's our volunteer core, our hands and, hands and feet. So those are all ways that you can help. And uh, yeah, and just, we all got to pull together. The bigger we get, the more, uh, you know, the more we can do. Yeah, you bet. And I mean, there's 2.2 million gun owners and I'm pretty sure most of them want to keep their guns. So 40 bucks a year, in my opinion, to have somebody out there, you know, because not everybody has time to, you know, get involved in one of these things. So the least you can do is, you know, show that support. And if that's all you did, you know, even just to have that membership to, like you say, maybe hire a few more people who can go out there and get the word out. And I mean, just imagine if even half the gun owners in Canada supported an organization like that, how, how much power we would have <laughs> can be, be yeah, yeah. The, these laws can be rolled back though oh, yeah they can like yeah. uh just like the the long gun registry and the there was a ban on what was it the cz 858 and swiss arms family rifles yeah yeah and that got pulled back so you nope, know that and that's now that's now back oh it's now back it's okay. back oh. bill c71 has that okay. it's just a big there's just a war yeah. going on right and you just and that's why right now you got to work harder than ever for a, a political organization we're not political Right. Like I don't carry water for the Conservative Party, yeah. right? And but they're the they're the party that that if anything leave us alone, and at you know at worst and at best advance our cause because we're just good citizens and we work hard and we play hard and we buy things and we we're consumers and and uh, we're law abiding and then there's a lot of reasons why we're a good voting bloc. Um, but uh, but the Liberals have just shown that that it's all about optics. But yeah, that that band's coming back. It's going to be back in within a week from now. Yeah, and you know, having spent a few days with you, and you know, we've had a lot of talks off camera, and 
you know, I think a lot of, some people might be thinking, well, you know, is this guy legit? And, you know, I can vouch that you, you know, you're a bona fide, you know, guns rights advocate and you're doing it the best way that I think can be done. And, you know, it's the real deal, you know, and I think there's a lot of things that maybe you would like to say, but you don't say. And I think you advance the cause in a way which is constructive and is going to have a positive impact for many years to come. So I wish you the best of luck in growing the Perfect. CCFR. And, you Thank know, you. I hope that we can uh, get you some more members here because I know there's a lot of subscribers here to my channel who obviously, you know, they're all about, you know, more gun rights and all that stuff. So, Absolutely. so that's all you have to do, guys. Go support the CCFR and, uh, yeah, subscribe to the channel. You'll learn a lot. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. No problem. If you were stuck in an elevator with somebody and you only had them for a minute, what would you say to them if they were, you know, an anti-gun person? Well, one minute's not enough time. But if yeah. you had a, if you had that opportunity and they were listening, uh, the first thing I would do is try to establish how much they knew, because yeah. chances are they don't know anything about gun ownership. Yeah. They know what they've seen on TV, which is guns equal death. If you own a gun, you are pro-death. Mm -hmm. And th this, is, this is what Canada's mainstream media pushes. Yeah. Um, they are incredibly biased. In fact, we have an a, um, a, a academic study going right now to actually physically prove that. First one ever. But nonetheless, um, I would find out what they knew. Yeah. You know, you'd, you'd again ask them that, that easy question to ask, like I said before, which is, um, do you think we should loosen restrictions on handguns? Of course, they're going to say, well, of course not. Just go, what are the existing restrictions on handguns? Mm -hmm. And they'll, they won't know. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the, that's the wedge. That's the wedge issue right there. That's the door opening just a little crack yeah. where you can be like, okay, so if you don't know what the existing rules are, how do you know we need more mm -hmm. or that we know need, or that, you know, we need less. So it really kind of puts the onus back on them. So if they can not get angry then you can start chipping away from there. Just okay. go, well, let me tell you what's involved in buying and, buying and using a handgun mm -hmm. in Canada, which is a pretty long list. So get them to have an awareness of what they don't know, basically. Absolutely. And, yeah. That's the real struggle. Okay. In an ideal world, what would gun rights look like in Canada from the CCFR perspective? If you could have any, you know, if you could have it how you wanted it, what would it look like? Well, that's, a, that's an incredibly polarizing question because our <laughs> community is incredibly divided. Yeah. And so our community, you have people that own guns and they're, they're pro-gun control. You have people that are moderates. I would probably consider m myself to be the moderate, edging a little bit more on more freedom. Mm -hmm. And then you have the absolutists. These are the hardcore libertarians, which are like yeah. no laws, no rules, full anarchy. I shouldn't say libertarians. Yeah. I would be more kind of the libertarian, yeah. but they're the anarchists. Okay. So they're like no licensing. Yeah. You know, everybody no gets machine checks. guns. Yeah, yeah, everybody gets machine guns. You buy them at the Shoppers Drug Mart, no ID, and right. you can buy ammo there, you know. And yeah. it's like, okay, well, you know, there's a lot of things that are a lot less harmful than a firearm that, that are regulated. So mm -hmm. that may not make sense to everybody. Yeah. But for me, the approach that I take is, is we have to consider that you need a majority government to change laws. And look at the, major look at the parties that form majority governments in Canada. You got the Liberals and you got the conservatives, and then a distant third, you know, snowball's chance in, in hell is the NDP, NDP yeah. right, to form a majority federal government. Mm -hmm. And so you look at those two parties and go, okay, how far would those two parties go? Because that's really all you got. You're not changing the laws unless you have a majority government, mm -hmm. and it's only going to be a one-term government if you're going to do extreme measures. So our position has always been we advocate for anything that we can defend. So we, for, for instance, we advocate for concealed carry. Um, we're not actively advocating for that, but we ha we're the only firearm organization that publishes all of our policies, what mm -hmm. we believe in, on our website. So if you say, well, what's the CCFR position on concealed carry? We'd be like, it's right there. Right. It's public information, which is we're for it because it's, it's a proven fact that concealed carry is a public safety net benefit, right. not a detriment. So, you know, we believe in that people should be able to own full autos, but there's, a, there's an extended, you know, there's an enhanced qualification part. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, aspect to that. Um, we're probably the um, only organization that says uh, that we will tolerate licensing. So our, our policy 
talks about licensing, and this is where we get into the real polarization. Right. You have the extreme views, like, no, lic licensing is gun control. It's like, well, yeah. In Canada, that's gun control you can overcome with a one-day course for 130 bucks, you yeah. know, and, and eight hours of your time. Yeah. So, you know, and then some people would say, oh, Rod, you're pro-gun control. It's like, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah. I think if you have full autos and concealed yeah. carry, I wouldn't exactly call myself pro-gun yeah. control. But for me, um, you know, licensing should be, right now, if, like storage display, like uh, paperwork and administrative offenses are criminal offenses in Canada. They shouldn't be. They should be fines. They should mm -hmm. be regulatory offenses. No one should have a criminal record for going like, yeah, I forgot to lock my safe, but no one was hurt. Mm -hmm. So um, we think that you should prove competency with a firearm. You should have a background check if you can buy unlimited guns in Canada. Uh, but it, when it comes to that, no registration because registration leaves a paper trail there for the next government to come in and say, well, you know what, we're going to take those guns. And lucky, we know where all of them are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we believe that you should have, you should be able to take your handguns out to the bush. If I can shoot a semi-auto 50 cal out here, yeah. I think a handgun is probably okay too. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things that we believe in, but it should be just a lot more accountability based because I think gun owners tend to be more libertarian, more freedom oriented people, conservatives mm -hmm. and libertarian. You have liberal gun owners too. Um, but we tend to be, want the government not telling us what we should do. We want them, I personally want them out of my life almost entirely. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, so it's, it's a really long list of items of what, the perfect gun you know what i what i could have if i could have everything yeah um but that's kind of the generality there just a lot less interference a little more freedom right up to the point where it's actually impacting public safety and then step it one step back okay yeah and i think my my opinion has always been that you don't want to put the cart before the horse in the sense that if you bring somebody uh who's really anti-gun if you propose to them like the anarchist perspective for instance they're never going to listen to that yeah they're going to slam the door in your face and you're not going to get far so you kind of have to start where you're at and where we're at unfortunately is at that point you know and i think it's there'll be some purists out there who think no you always have to advocate 100 percent for there's some people who you know take that approach of no you always have to be 100 percent advocating full-on freedom if you don't do that then it's a slippery slope mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you know i would take the approach of that well you, you kind of have to start where you're at and you have to get people listening first because if you can't convince there's that one saying what was it abraham lincoln you know you you kill your enemies by making them your friends so i think if you can convince somebody that hey gun owners aren't that bad and then what you've done is you've gotten rid of the opposition mm -hmm. so you know, if you can present it in such a way where you're not being oppositional with people, then maybe you'll see more success doing that. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's sort of the, the, that's the, that's the path that we've taken because a lot of times you get people, people always confuse Canada with the United States, right? And, and the United States is like, oh, Second Amendment, no, you know, no restrictions whatsoever. Well, they have a codified right there to, mm -hmm. to own firearms. And, you know, a lot of people here, you get, not a lot of people, but you have, you have a few folks that are just like, well, Magna Carta, man. And it's like, you know, like we're trying to attach what we're doing, our activities, as close to reality as we can. We're starting with goals that we're, we think we can reach. Mm -hmm. So we, we're not an organization that says, okay, you know what? We have $2 million and we're going to spend it on some, uh, you know, launch some constitutional challenge that the Magna Carta supersedes it. Like we can't get there because as, as was demonstrated to us, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that the that Quebec, the province of Quebec, was not entitled to the old long gun registry data. And there was a firearm organization that said, oh, this is the only way to win. You take them to the Supreme Court, all that stuff. And they won. And then the Canadian government is giving the data anyway. Because they're like, we're the government. What are you going to do? Yeah. It doesn't matter if we break the law. And now you're like, what? what? <laughs> so yeah. for us, those, those types of um, really philosophical you know, constitutional challenges not going to work for us, at least in the mm -hmm. short term. So as an organization, we thought, well, you know what? I'd rather have something mm -hmm. to show for all of this money and all of this effort. And so what I'd like to see in the short term, I'd like to see magazine capacity limits go away. That would improve my life significantly. I like um, the restricted class. Um, there's something called the simplified classification system out there where firearms are, are classified based on overall length. Mm -hmm. Not not barrel length and not any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'd love to. That would make a big difference to my life. Yeah. Because now I could bring my AR out here. 
yeah. instead of going to the range with my AR, but I can bring an AR, something that looks just like an AR out here. Right. You know, it's semantic. It's not, no, no connection yeah. of public safety. Something even better than an AR you could bring well, yeah. on here. <laughs> um, I'd like, I'd like um, we're, we advocate actively for having people that own rural property, if they live in an area where firearms can be legally and safely discharged, then they should be able to discharge any firearm they own, including handguns or prohibs if they mm -hmm. own them. Think common sense, things like that. We'd like to get those things. And this is a fight that's been going on forever in the firearms community. It's, we, we call it, one side is called the no compromise. We want everything. Well, you know what they've gotten? They've got nothing. Nothing, yeah. And, and it's not that I, I want everything too, but mm -hmm. I want to get something out of this. Yeah. And if I could get just those things it's... that I mentioned, and then I was gone, I'd be like, yeah, yeah. you know what? I did something. It's chess, not checkers, right? So we got to, got to be strategic with how we go about this. So yeah, it's, yeah. and it's, and it's difficult because I see that mm -hmm. side too. I see the no, no compromise part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. I do. But I'm just, I'm, you know, you got to have a strategy and you've got to try to get something out of this. It's not a negotiation. It's really a war, a war of words. And I mm -hmm. want, I want something. I want to show something that, you know, have something something to show that we did something. Right. Yeah. And so I'll take, uh, I'll take those, those things. There, yeah. There'd be a, a, a big benefit for the people that, uh, that have guns and handguns and all the rest of that stuff. And, and then we move on to the next thing. And if we can keep moving on to the next thing, then we'll get to the no compromise point eventually. Yeah. But, and I, we live in a country where, I mean, there's so many places to shoot. Like there's so much hunting and like, there's just, there's thousands of reasons to own a gun, you know, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, aside just uh, self-defense. So, yeah, including self -defense. you know, including self-defense. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if Canada doesn't, if they take away all of Canadian guns then you know, where, where, where will you be able to shoot 50 years from now? Yeah. So something to consider guys. The best way to support this YouTube channel is to support yourself by gearing up through CanadianPreparedness.com or BugOutRoll.ca. Premium quality gear at the best possible price using the incredibly secure and easy to use Shopify platform. We offer free shipping to the United States for orders over $200 USD and free shipping to Canada over $75. So support the channel by supporting yourself.